Who knows that God's created 24 hours in the day and that's all he's given us because that's enough time to well and truly muck it up sometimes. And then when we go to sleep and get up the next morning and you hang your legs over the side of the bed and you go, hallelujah God, your mercy's in you every morning and it's a new day. Yeah? I love that. Because me being male, that sums probably 80% of it up. And then stubborn sometimes, that sums the rest of it up. And of my own mindset, then that well and truly sums the rest of it right up. I go about life making decisions without consulting my father. I realise we all do, do we? Yeah. And what that does is it stops us from achieving everything our God has planned for us. Here's the key. The way we look at that and the way we allow that to affect the rest of our day is whether or not we win or lose. Would you agree? So here we go. This is what a scientist says. I don't know his name. I couldn't even pronounce it. Your chance to change your past is gone. Your life up until this point is a sum of lost opportunities. This is sounding fantastic, isn't it? Keeping you from focusing on your past, the lost opportunities, always looking backwards and unable to learn from it. So what scientists reckon the, the problem is with people who focus too much on their past. And that leads us to one amazing big thing which not many people like, but it's a willingness to change. Who likes change? Come on, let's see some hands. Okay, let's do it this way. Who doesn't like change? Who's half and a halfer? <laughs> Let's backtrack to the very th first thing I said. God has allowed us to have 24 hours a day and he wakes us up the next morning for a brand new day. I believe our God is interested in change. Although he is the same yesterday, today and forever, that's not good enough for you and I, is it? Not at all. Not at all. So when you hang the legs over the side of the bed and get up that next morning and you go, God, thank you for the opportunity to change my future. It's a powerful thought. Anyway, I had to read that out because when I found that from that scientist, Hugen Flugendugen, I can't remember his name. It really was pretty wild. Seems irrelevant. And all his science degree is, it doesn't seem entirely right when you have a God who's sent his son for us. Amen? And that's the God we serve. So a willingness to change. That's what I want to first talk about. Who knows of the mighty Murray River? It's situated between, it runs from the New South Wales Alps, it runs from the Victorian Alps, and it feeds this massive torrent which puts out this humongous amount of megalitres per second. That's when it's in flood. So you reckon there's a lot of change going on when it's in flood? The river is alive. The river is ever-changing. The river is moving. The river is full of life. To the point where it says, when I researched the Murray River, it stretches over 2,508 kilometres. So in the old scale, for those... Uh, 1,558 miles. 
That is massive. Let me read some of these stats out to you. It's height, so the distance it comes from, from the Alps down to out the mouth, is 902 metres. It travels 2,508 kilometres and puts out 767 cubic litres Cubic litres, no, cubic metres per second out the mouth. And it's a constant flow. It's not affected by the tide, it's a constant flow. One of the very few rivers that push out all the time because of the sheer volume of what it does. Obviously high tides affect it a little bit, what not, don't... It's an amazing river based on the fact that when it's running the way it's supposed to run, it is so beneficial to those that it supports. It says that it's the food hub of that area. It's been known to be the food hub of that area. It's resource. It's ability to have fish stocks like nothing else. It's ability to be able to have sources of income like the old, who remembers, come on. This will show it. Who remembers all the rivers run? Come on. With the old paddle boats. Well, they still run today. They look a lot flasher than they did back then. And are they still steam? Some of them might be still steam. They might be electric now. I moved with everything else. See, change. So that's when it's in full flight. That's when it's good. What about when it's in drought? What happens when it stops moving? Right up the back in some of the lower lying areas. What happens when it stops moving? The water becomes stagnant. The fish trapped in those ponds begin to die. Life stops. See, that's what happens to the river. The abundance of life that it is, the source that it is, the the ability to be able to be everything that it is stops when it's in drought. And I think sometimes as human beings, we go through these drought times where stuff in your life starts to die. The ponds, the rivers don't flow anymore. So therefore, the ponds that become stagnant dry waters can no longer supply the precious food source that's required. That's what happens when you don't change. It's what happens when you don't like change. So you stay in the same spot, and now there's fish, I looked into it, and there's fish that migrate right up and down that river because they know that if they stayed right up the top, they're about to hit a drought, so they know that they need to move. The seasons of change happen, so they know they need to move. So off they go, these humongous schools of fish, just down the river. Because they know they need to move to somewhere that's going to stay fully stocked, live, living, moving. But the ones who don't, the ones who are lazy... And don't like to change, because I've got, I love John. The, the, I went and did some concreting at John's place. That was a beautiful big home. And um, his joke about the shed, it's more like a, a lunchbox. <laughs> I think I heard Lynn say. She, she, was, she was amazed at how all the stuff that come out of her old kitchen couldn't go into a new kitchen and she was in a, she didn't know how. The things women think about, eh? How am I going to fit all this in this kitchen? Huh? (laughs) Whereas John just goes, under the house, get in. But see, the river, when it's alive and living, 
is a precious food source. The river, the river when it's in drought, is a dangerous place to be. Because if you don't stay on the move, if you don't stay focused on the seasons that are around you, if you don't be aware of your surroundings, you can be stuck in a stagnant pond, drying up. And that's what life's like sometimes. We can get ourselves to the point where we actually are dry. Come on, I'm not the only one. Who's with me? You can get to that point. Let's go back to the very first thing I said. We wake up that next morning and it's a new day. And it's a new day. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. So I want to take us through some peas. I had six peas, but I've combined two, so there's only four now. If for the mathematicians. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter, uh, not Mark, Matthew chapter 9. Please. Matthew chapter 9. And it's verse 16. So Matthew 9, 16. It says, No one sews a patch on an unshrunk cloth. And no one sh- yeah, no one sews a patch on an unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch will pull away and tear. Neither do you pour old wine... And neither do you pour new wine into a wine into an old wine skin, for the for they do for if you do, the skin will burst, the wine will be ruined, the wine skin will be ruined also. But no, they pour new wine into new wine skins. So the first P is prepare. You know, I get on Google and I look up on YouTube, good old Google and YouTube. You can find anything and everything these days. You've got to be careful what you click on, otherwise you can find more than you bargain for. But you type in wineskin and you look up how a wineskin is made. And you know what the first thing that comes to my mind is? There needs to be a sacrifice. There needs to be a sacrifice. See, you can't have a wineskin without a sacrifice. And that's what life's like sometimes. Who's been through sacrifices? Yeah. I think we all have. So you are well and truly prepared for a new wineskin. Because at first and foremost, you need a sacrifice. Then they grab the skin of the animal and they prepare it. They sew it together. They trim it to size first. They mark it all out. They make sure out of the skin, this is how diligent they are. They put the template on the skin to actually get as many wineskins out of one piece of skin as possible. See, God wants to use you to the fullest of your opportunities. Not like this scientist who just says, oh, well, your past is in the past. It's gone. Forget about it. There's nothing you can do. It's a sum of who you are now. And if that's bad, well, then serve yourself right. God says, no, if you've been through sacrifices, I'm going to put my template on you and I'm going to work out how I can maximize everything I've sown into you. Doesn't matter how big that is, God puts his template down and goes, now if I go this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, I can get 10 wineskins because he's the super craftsman. Is he not? He knows it best. He doesn't just sometimes go like Les does and goes, no, that template doesn't fit there. I'm going to put it here. Like we do. They lay the template out, they mark it out, then they begin to cut. And the cutting's not so pleasant sometimes. But they begin to cut. And they fashion out this perfect wineskin. Then he goes along, the seamstress goes along and he stitches it together. And the process that he goes through of stitching it together blowing it up with a bit of pressure, putting water in it to make sure it doesn't leak, 
then putting a lid on it and putting pressure back in it again to make sure that everything's going to sustain. There's no leaks, there's no drips, there's no... So you think you're on the right track sometimes and you think you're prepared and you're going along and all of a sudden God applies a little bit of pressure to see whether you've got any leaks. To see whether you're going to drip under pressure. An expert. An unknown quantity in a drip under pressure. That's what an expert is. But that whole process sometimes is still quite painful. As God checks to see whether what he's placed in you is going to be able to be something that's sustained so as he can fill you up with new wine. Because he doesn't want to fill you up with old stuff. He wants to do something new every day. He wants to pour something new. See, the way we did life... 200 years ago is not the same way we do life today. I say to people all the time, the methods to bake a carrot cake are completely different, ever-changing. However, the ingredients remain the same. And that's what our God is like. The ingredients and the sum of what our God is never changes. But as generations come along, we need to be doing something different to reach those generations. We can't remain the same. I love some of the old hymns. Absolutely love them to bits. But I think I would get sick of them all the time because I love change. I love something new. Who liked the new song this morning? This is Amazing Grace. Come on. There's plenty of good ones out there that speak out the word of God. Speak out what's being done like the old. But see, God's doing a new thing. God's doing a new thing. He's taking us into a new thing because this generation over here needs a new thing. This generation here needs a new thing. The older generation of our, of our church body need a new thing. We can't remain the same. You become stagnant like the fish up the Murray. So be prepared. Then finally, the wine skin gets filled up with wine because it's served its purpose. It's been through all the tests. It's been through all the challenges. It's passed everything. And all of a sudden, the winemaker decides that he's going to put wine into that skin that is going to mature, that is going to be, forgive me if you're not a wine drinker, but when you start a wine that's not brand, brand new, it tastes quite horrible. But then as you leave it for longer and as God matures those things in your life, and in the right time and in the right opportunity, he brings them out and they are sweet and beautiful and perfect in his sight. That's the beauty of what this talks about here. And God wants to do something new in your life today that's going to prepare you for the future. Amen. I'm excited about that. <clears throat> Jared, have you got that? I've got a little clip here for you because the first two are prepared and the past. Now, the past is sometimes something that's painful. The past is sometimes something that holds us back, that stops us from moving forward because our focus... Do you know why our eyes are positioned in the front of our head? Because we're moving forward. Do you know if you look throughout the animal kingdom, what good old Steve Irwin hey, says the apex predator, crikey, the apex predator has the eyes further forward in the head of the mammal, reptile, whatever it is. Unless you're a spider, then you've got eyes everywhere and you can see the, the whole lot. The reason God created us that way is because we are the absolute apex predator. Do you know, I, I lose vision. Think about it this way. When I stand here and look, I can see less of what's behind me. Does that make sense? I did explain that real well. 
But my focus is forwards. And that's less than what I can see behind me. So how much more should we focus on moving forward than focusing on the past? See, sometimes I think we get stuck like this. And then you go, dunk. And run into something because your focus is on your past. Why don't you play that little clip for us, Jared? Who loves the Lion King? I love the Lion King. There's some cracker little adult bits in there that just go right over top of kids' heads. And here's one of them, so. What was that? (laughs) The weather. (laughs) Very peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. (laughs) Yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm going to take your stick. No, 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 no! Not your stick! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! Good! Go on! Get out of here! That's one excited baboon. But how true is that? How true is that? See, we get so focused on looking at our past. Like good old Rafiki says there, your past is there to learn from it. Notice when he swung the stick the second time, Simba ducked. And he got all excited about the fact that, see, it doesn't matter so often what happens in the past. They're the opportunities, and this is where this scientist has it so wrong. Because in Christ, he allows you to see the things in your past and it steers you perfectly for the future. See, it gives you a hope. My past gives me a hope to move forward. And without hope, the people perish. My past gives me a hope because I know that if I've been through those sorts of things, God has prepared me for something and I'm going to be able to walk in this. See, the beauty of that is that we serve a God that knows you can handle what you're going through. Sometimes we don't think that. We don't understand that. But your God knows you can handle what he's put before you. He believes in you. He's on your side. He's cheering you on. He's got your back. When you start to change your mindset about that, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of this entire universe, believes in you. Why do we not sometimes believe in ourself? Anyway, that's a thought. We'll keep moving. The present. It's the next P. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse seventeen. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation, he has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. See, God expects the new. God expects the new. In our present situation, that's a verse we can stand on. That the old has passed away and the new is here or the new is coming. I can't wait to be worshipping God. You thought worship was good this morning? Can you imagine what worship in heaven is going to be like? I, that just, I better, not, I better not think about that too much. I'll, I'll get my girl on and start to cry. <clears throat> the next P's are position and place. 
Let's go to Joshua chapter 6. And this is a big one. So I'm going to call on my mate, Gene, to come out and read this one for us. I've got it here, Gene. Same Bible. <coughs> no, it actually is. <laughs> okay. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Oh, sorry, uh, verse 4, Joshua 6, verse 4. I'll just start that again. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of them. And he ordered the army, Advance. March around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp, and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven, seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. So position and place. God gave Joshua exactly an outlay of what was required. And everyone there knew their position and knew their place. And I love the way that it's orchestrated right down. And I wanted all of that read. And we'd have been here a fair while if I read it. So thank you, Jean. <clears throat> Because that is a, a very clear outline of a, a, a man who had first heard from God and knew exactly what was required to win the battle. See, so often we go through life and we don't know our position and don't know our place. We don't know where we fit. Who's ever said that? Oh, I'm just trying to find out where I fit at the moment. You start a new job. Yeah, I'm just trying to find out where I fit. School teachers have that every year. They've got 30-odd kids that are just trying to find where they fit. So they see that over and over again. But God clearly laid out here exactly what was required and exactly what needed to happen. Church, I want to challenge us with this this morning. Because it says up the back there, a little bit right at the start, it says he positioned the armies and he told them what to do, but don't say a word. Do what I've told you to do, but don't say a word. And then on the seventh day, he says to them, now do what? Shout. Now shout. 
Acts Church, you who sit here, who are the church, not this building, it's time to shout. It's time to shout. Because there's a community out there that needs a church that knows how to keep up with changes. It's time to shout. We're on this march and we've got the march and we're happening and we're doing stuff. And church is going good. Sunday mornings are going good. We're starting to grow again. Praise God. God is doing something. But God was doing something here and they were told to be quiet. God was still doing something. And he gets us to this point where he says, now, now, now's the time. Shout it out. Shout it out. We all know the rest of the story. The walls come down. They were defeated except one family. Everything in the city was completely plundered. It was quite brutal. But they received the victory. Who's ready for a victory in their life? What do you got to do? It's time to shout. It's time to be prepared. Learn from the past. Being aware of who we are in God's presence in the present. Learning our position and place. Because there's only one reason we're here. And it's to win the prize. The prize of accepting Jesus into your heart. And I want to give the opportunity this morning for that. A fresh or for the first time, it doesn't matter. If you've got stagnant, dried up areas in your life and you want to say no today, it's done, it's dusted. See, unlike the Murray River who has to wait for the seasons of change, our God can change them in an instant. You don't have to wait for the rainy season. You can get out of your seat this morning, you can come and do business before the Lord and he can pour out upon you fresh living water this morning. He can make those dried up areas in your life full of life again, flowing freely, moving. The things that you might have put on the back burner, the things that you you might have thought, well, that was a dream and that was a vision and that that was something I believe God was going to do for me. It's time to shout, church. It's time to shout. It's time to stand up here this morning or even stand in your seats. I don't care where you do it. But it's time to stand up and go, our God is the God above all gods. And there's nothing in this world that's too too hard for him. I as a man have my limits. So thank goodness I'm not God. But we serve an all-powerful, almighty God. I said to the worship team this morning, being in India and seeing there's so many hundreds of gods that people worship over there, the old elephant God, that you give him your blessing for 11 days and then you've got to take it back. Because if you don't take it back, you're not blessed. So you give your blessing, then you take it back, and then you get the blessing. Ay, 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 ay. Who knows our God isn't that complicated? Come on. You can get out here this morning and you can just do business with our God and he's willing to pour into your lap more than you can handle. More than you can sustain because that's what he wants because he's aware of the fact that there's a community out there that needs you ready for change. Does that make sense? Now who loves change? Still no one. (laughs) See, when you change and your focus has shifted from your past to moving forwards on God and where God wants you, there shouldn't be a person in this place that's not wrapped and excited and passionate and stirred up about the changes that God wants to do in your life, in this church family and in this community. Come on, it's time to shout. Acts Church, it's time to shout. Come on, it is time to shout. 
Let's not be like Simba who relies on sometimes focuses on the past because it hurts. Yeah, geez, don't worry about it. It was in the past, but it still hurts. Of course it still hurts. God has blessed you with a phenomenal brain to be able to learn from the past and move forward into him. Praise God. So why don't the musos and singers come back? We're going to sing the time has come to stand for what we believe in. So you reckon the armies of, that were with Joshua that day followed him blindly? Do you reckon that was the case? I don't think it was. They didn't follow their leader Joshua blindly. They followed him because he'd heard from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they knew that they knew that they knew God was going to pour out the victory. So as we sing this, this again this morning, I want you to get excited. This isn't one of those altar calls that you come out and be quiet at. I want you to get excited. I want you to shout this out over those areas in your life. I want you to stand up here and see, there was one song this morning that says, darkness will tremble at the sound of His voice. Well, come on, church. We have to shout out His voice this morning. So as the darkness that our community has in them needs to hear the voice of God. They need to hear that. And where's that come from? It doesn't come from, it can come from a loud noise in here on Sunday morning. And we can make a loud shout. We can open doors and let the world know that we're here. But it's what happens during the week. It's what happens. It's what you take out of this place during the week. And you shout it out at your schools. You shout it out at your workplace. You shout it out wherever you are. Come on. I want you to come out the front. If that's you tonight, that's you. I want you to come and shout out, speak life into those areas. So let's go.